It has been said that every plant you see around you has some use to man. It is simply up to man to discover these uses. Well then, let us set about that journey. Welcome to Survival Training School of California's Off the Land, the advanced guide to using wild plants. During the course of this video, we will take you step by step through the identification, harvest, and processing of dozens of wild useful plants commonly found all across the globe. From making medicinal teas for a full range of ailments, to producing string and rope from wild plants, turning acorns into food, to trying our hand at delicious recipes, and so much more, you will feel like a master of the plant kingdom after finishing these lessons. So let's talk about how this works. Scientists divide all life into kingdoms, hence the scientific names of the plants displayed. The first word displayed is known as the plant's genus and is always capitalized. The second word is known as the plant's species, which is never capitalized. To those who live off the land, however, plants are divided into three categories according to use, edible, medicinal, and utility. As such, we will discuss these categories and how they apply to each plant herein. As you will soon see, it is rare for a plant to fall in only a single category. In fact, many wild plants are filled with diverse and seemingly contradictory uses. It is important to observe the plants here very carefully. Take note of the size of the plant. What type of vegetation do you see growing around it? What type of environment does it appear to be growing in? Take note of the size and shapes of leaves and flowers, and how many of each is attached to the stems. Your keen observation, combined with our striking footage, will make you never want to struggle with identifying wild plants from complicated sketches or poor photographs ever again. So one last tip before we start. The majority of plant species in an area will occur in what is referred to as a riparian area. The riparian is simply the area of vegetation around a body of water. So the best place to begin looking for wild useful plants is in these riparian areas. So now, let us begin. We will begin our lessons with a plant that may surprise you. A plant that you may not only have thought couldn't possibly be useful to man, but perhaps even avoid. This plant is your Tika dioca, or stinging nettles. Stinging nettles get their name from what can be a very painful sting they deliver by simply brushing against them with exposed skin. The nettle plant is covered in small harmless hairs, if you will, which are in turn coated with skin irritating acids. These acids are neutralized by heating or drying, however, which renders the herb highly useful to man. Various species of stinging nettles are common along creek beds all over the world at a wide variety of altitudes and latitudes, so you should have no trouble finding them. Let us begin with nettles most popular and perhaps most unexpected use as a food. As noted earlier, the harmful acids on nettles are neutralized by heating. Therefore, nettle leaves are boiled for two to five minutes, rendering them highly edible. Nettles are extremely nutritious and are even high in protein and starches, not to mention a full range of vitamins and minerals. It's a veritable superfood and has saved people from starvation in times of famine throughout man's history. The nettle plant is also used as refreshing and nutritious tea, which brings us to our first processing lesson, making tea from wild plants. There are two primary forms of herbal teas, decoctions and concoctions. With concoctions, the water is brought to a boil and is then removed from the heat source and the herb is immediately added. The cooking vessel is then covered and the herb is allowed to sit in the water until it cools, at which point it is ready for consumption and can be heated or chilled to taste. Generally speaking, any leafy herb is prepared this way, so the nutrients and chemicals therein are not destroyed by excessive heat. 
With decoctions, the herb is placed in boiling water and brought to a simmer for about one to three minutes. The vessel is then removed from its heat source and the herb is kept in the water until it cools, at which point it is ready and can be heated or chilled to taste as well. This method is generally used with stems, barks, and woodier herbs as their thicker cell walls require more heat to break down and allow their nutrients and chemicals to flow into the water. Now back to stinging nettles, where we will move on to their medicinal uses. Nettles are considered so beneficial for so many of your body systems it is referred to as a tonic herb. It has historically been used as a concoction for a skin, hair, and nail rinse or soak, as a diuretic to purify the system, as an expectorant, as a cold and flu reliever, as an allergy fighter, and so much more. The root extract is commonly used for the treatment of men's prostate as well as to boost natural testosterone levels in men. And the fresh plant is even whipped against painfully swollen joints which is said to numb the affected area and greatly reduce pain, a use that dates back to the time of Roman soldiers who employed it in this manner. A tea from nettle can be made from the dried or fresh plant. When drying plants, place the herb in a cool dark place away from direct light for up to seven days depending on the herb. It should retain most of its color if dried properly, should not turn brown, and should not be so dry it crumbles into powder upon touching it. Immediately upon drying, the herb should be placed in an airtight jar or bag away from moisture or direct light until use. It is important to cure plants carefully to retain their active chemical and nutrient constituencies. In the utility category, nettle is used as a soil fertilizer, both in liquid form and as a whole mulch. The extract is used in cheese production. The dried fibers from the stalk serve as a cordage and clothing very close to cotton and has been used in large scale clothing production. And the same dried fibers also serve as a fine fire tinder. As you can see, stinging nettle is an amazing plant with a whole world of uses. And the ones we covered here are just the beginning. We highly recommend researching this plant and finding how it can relate to you. As mentioned in the previous lesson, stinging nettles make a fine cordage, which is just a generic term for any twine, string, or rope. The most ancient and widely used cordage plant in man's history, however, is the noble Asclepius, or milkweeds. Milkweeds are known as such due to the milk, if you will, that flows from the plant when the stem is punctured, which also makes it very hard to misidentify. There are over 100 species of milkweeds all over the world and they grow everywhere from meadows to grassy hillsides to lush creek beds and some species are even cultivated. 
Though they may vary widely in medicinal and edible uses, they all produce cordage. The two most common milkweeds in America are narrow-leafed milkweed and showy milkweed. In the medicinal category, milkweeds are said to have a wide array of uses, from asthma to emetics. The most common modern use, however, and perhaps the safest, is to apply the milk to warts on a daily basis until the wart is gone. In the edible category, though many species of milkweeds are said to be poisonous, species like showy milkweed produce an edible pod. The pod is sliced open, the immature flower is removed, and the pod is then boiled for approximately three minutes and consumed. These pods are even beginning to find their way into specialty food markets. Now for the utility category. In this category, milkweed's primary use to man is as a cordage. There are two main types of cordage plants, stalk cordage and leaf cordage. With stalk cordage, fibers run the entire length of the plant's stalk. The stalk is bent and pressed, even lightly smashed with rocks or other tools, to separate the fibers from the stalk, and the fibers are then carefully peeled away. With leaf cordage, the plant's leaf is comprised of long fibers compressed together. The leaf is lightly struck with a rock or tool to separate the fibers. When bending and striking a cordage plant, be sure not to use too much force and damage the fibers. Once the fibers are separated, they are ready for use. The fibers can simply be twisted and used as small ties or, if actual twine is needed, a technique known as the reverse wrap can be used to weave the fibers together into any length or thickness you need. The reverse wrap also adds 30% more strength than simply using twisted fibers. To perform the reverse wrap, assemble the fibers in the thickness you would like your twine to be, then divide the fibers in half. Now, cross the fibers at the top and either tie them in a knot or hold them securely. Now, with your fibers divided and laying across your lap, Grab the fibers that are farthest away from your body and twist them away from yourself. Then wrap the twisted fibers toward yourself like so. Continue this process until you near the end of your fibers. When performing the wrap, Maintain a 45 degree angle in the V formed by your two sections of fibers. Also, be sure to keep tension on the two sections to ensure a tight and symmetrical weave. When you are ready to increase the length of your cordage, simply grab two new sections of fibers, overlap the two old sections, and continue the weave just as if it were one piece. Going in the V at a 45 degree angle, continue the twist, wrap, 
away, twist away, wrap towards. Twist away, wrap towards. Twist away, wrap towards. Twist away, wrap towards. Now this is the same way you'll produce a bow string, rope, any type of long length of cordage you're going to use this reverse wrap because you're going to have to splice the natural materials together. After just a few twists and wraps, your fibers will be spliced together and will be held securely. The reverse wrap is very simple yet very effective and can be done without any tools or utensils. So from now on, whenever we mention that a plant is used as cordage, you will know exactly what we mean. One last interesting fact about the milkweed plant. Not only is it extremely useful to mankind, but it is the one and only food of the monarch butterfly. Now for a plant with some amazing properties, the soap root. Soap roots grow on moist green hillsides across California and are the king of soap making plants. Soap roots can be quite easy to gather and in moist soil can even be pulled directly out of the ground with no digging. In the edible category, soap roots are also known as soap potatoes and can be roasted the same way, making them highly edible with a taste similar to the potato. In the medicinal category, the soap the root produces is said to benefit skin conditions like eczema as well as rashes like poison oak and ivy. In the utility category, soap root's primary use is not very surprising, as a soap. The soap root, like all plants that produce soap, contains a chemical known as saponins. These saponins have surfactant properties, which simply means they grab water molecules and allow them to pass through fats and oils, which produces the rich lathering action. These saponins are even said to have steroidal compounds attached to them which may explain their use as a medicinal soap. As one of the most popular over-the-counter skin treatments, cortisone is also a steroid. Making soap with a root is quite easy. Simply peel away the outer covering and smash the white bulb with water and there you have it. The soap roots, like some other soap plants, are also referred to as fish stupefiers. The saponins in the plants are toxic to fish but not to humans, which means you can simply produce enough of the rich soapy lather in water where fish are present to stun and catch them. The hairs that surround the root can also be used exactly like boar bristle and can be made into tooth and hair brushes. The soap root also produces glue, 
The root bulb is basically comprised of the soapy gel and fibers. Pounding